Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came, and they asked Jesus, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given, for to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that, seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen, but never understand, and you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's a common place to say Jesus taught in parables. The Gospels say as much, but it was not the only way he taught. I mean, we know also from Scripture that in more intimate settings with his inner circle of disciples, as we heard today, Jesus would use more direct and theological language. But, you know, if I think we're to say to most anyone, anyone even on the street within at least Canadian society, the word parable, I'm sure the image of Jesus would pop into mind. He is that strongly associated with this method of teaching. Father John P. Mayer, the great Catholic scholar who authored a, I would call it a magisterial four-volume work on the historical Jesus, well, he observed that it's a form virtually unique to Jesus in Christian tradition, which is rather remarkable. No other figure in New Testament literature or in the early church really uses the parable, not St. Paul or St. John, nor any of the early successors of the apostles. I mean, they might use a metaphor here and there, they might uh, make comparisons, but never in the narrative form as Jesus does. And it prompts one to ask, why is this so unique to Jesus? Well, for one, it's effective, but it's also protective. It's a demonstration to us followers of the effective application of language in conveying truth over the use of force to demonstrate power. 
in being wise as serpents, as Jesus tells us to be, because we are surrounded by wolves. I mean, we need to remember that Jesus preached publicly. He put himself out there, just like John the Baptist before him, and we all know what happened to John. To speak publicly, even about ostensibly spiritual matters, was to challenge the ruling establishment. The powerful don't want us to have fulfilling, virtuous lives. They want us in our sins, and miserable, and fearful, and always looking to them for the solution to our troubles. You know, to preach a vision for humanity that calls us to live in accordance with the truth is to suggest that we're not living that way now. And who has led us to this sorry state? Too often those who govern do so through, well, they do so through lies and half-truths, and they maintain their positions through intimidation. Now, that's not always the case. The church celebrates just rulers and encourages those in political leadership to emulate them. However, you know, this, this, this call to emulate is often seen as a criticism and not as the church fulfilling its role as moral guide and ethical advisor to society, but simply as being political opposition. So it doesn't matter that Jesus expressly said on more than one occasion that he was not interested in political power. It matters that those in political power took an interest in him as a threat. You know, in contrast, and in reference to the fact that we don't see early church leaders teaching in parables, has a lot to do with the fact that in the early church, um, it wasn't uh, as public. It wasn't as out there as Jesus was in the public sphere. What we have in the way of texts that survive from those days are, well, they're internal communications, things read at the Sunday gathering, letters between bishops, catechisms for disciples, and manuals for pastors. Now, there are a few instances of public communication. We have letters that were public defenses of Christianity, but they use the legal language and rhetorical conventions of the Roman Empire. That is, they're, they're delivered not as gospel lessons, but as legal defenses of a persecuted community in terms that a Roman magistrate would understand, uh, not so much a, a Judean farmer or a Greek peasant. All of this is to say that we see in Jesus' approach to teaching the truth of God is that there's a lesson in it for us. I mean, we live in difficult times when free speech, the hallmark of our constitution and democratic order, the guarantor of our civilization is under attack by the powerful. And not only is it under, it's under assault legislatively, culturally, and technologically, and our bishops, of course, as I pointed out a couple of weeks ago, have drafted and published a letter very much speaking from these concerns. And I again invite you to read that letter posted on our website and at the diocesan website. <coughs> What's troubling is some of these efforts appear designed deliberately to frustrate and to anger, to push people beyond the exercise of speech toward violence. I rather like what the late British, British musician and songwriter John Lennon once said in Warning. When it gets down to having to use violence, he said, then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you, pull your beard, flick your face to make you fight. Because once they've got you violent, then they know how to handle you. The only thing they don't know how to handle is nonviolence and good humor. Now, I don't know if Lenin was conscious at the time of his being very much speaking in the vein of gospel wisdom, of having connection to Isaiah's suffering servant and to the passion of Christ. Jesus was insulted and provoked physically by his enemies. One can't help but be reminded that Jesus, with one careful exception, never lifted his hand against anyone or anything, that he employed humor and he used his intellect to deal with the murderous inclinations of his enemies. And so must we. Now the genius of the parable, as Jesus deployed it, lies in what, again to reference Father Mayer, a fierce polemic thrust, full of surprises, paradoxes, and sudden reversals. It can be an attack on the very way the audience views God, religion, the world, and themselves. The parable is thus often a challenge to change one's vision and one's action 
In short, it is one of Jesus' favorite ways of calling people to repentance, a basic change in mind and in life. So Jesus is beyond clever when he uses parables. They're far more sophisticated than other contemporary examples of the use of this form of teaching. I mean, yeah, it's a metaphor, it's an allegory, but his parables, in contrast to so many others, are unpredictable. They overturn expectation. They shake us up. They also give some comfort. But to paraphrase a popular saying, they also afflict the comfortable. And also, given the dangerous times in which Jesus taught and acted, they have this wonderful defense built in. So often the Pharisees, temple officials, scribes, the Herodians, the Roman spies, if they're tempted to challenge him, to accuse him of all sorts of heinous crimes against the state, of sedition, of disloyalty, of offering insult to the rulers and magistrates, Jesus was always able to say, oh, you were offended by what I said? Why did you think I was talking about you? Equally so, with the common people of the land, with the sinners who were many, they could listen with a certain amount of satisfaction that Jesus was, how shall we put it, taking the mickey out of the rich and the powerful, only to, upon a little self-reflection, find he was talking about them as well. They could see in what he was saying explanations as to why things had gotten so bad. You know, the parable of the sower isn't just about the spreading of gospel in the future, but to those who heard it 2,000 years ago, they had to ask themselves, how is it that Israel, seeded with the word of God through Moses and the prophets, had come to this time of political, cultural, religious, and even geographic fragmentation? How had the holy city of Jerusalem become a pit of corruption? How had the royal courts of Herod's princes descended into iniquity? How had the common folk in towns and villages across the land, on farms and in their workshops, come into such a state of anxiety for the future and depression over the current state of affairs? Yet despite this clear criticism coming from Jesus, aimed at them as much as those who were in charge, they could also see how much he sincerely cared for them, for their immediate material well-being and for their eternal salvation. So the response for the majority was not an angry one, but they did listen with their ears and they came to understand with their hearts. They came to a thoughtful contemplation of what Jesus had said. They could ponder that parable of the sower and consider whether they had been truly receptive to God's word. Again, you know, as I speak about the concerns of our bishops, we see laws enacted in Canada constitutional changes in some United States states, in Ireland, proposed legislation for the European Union and the enforcement of hate laws in the United Kingdom and Finland, all indicating a trend towards the constraining of free discussion. The enforcement of this strange new orthodoxy that does not allow us to question or to even state plainly what we can see happening with our own eyes. The powerful tell us that to do so is to incite hatred, to encourage sedition, and to be disloyal to the state and its rulers. And this is unforgivable. So is it time for us all to start speaking publicly in parables? When challenged by another about our Christian faith, do we launch into fables as ingenious as those Jesus taught? Well, I think not, because I'm not as clever as our Lord. And as bright as many as you are, we're never going to be good, as good as he is. Yet we do need to think about what we are to say and to frame our comments on whatever controversy in terms that are faithful to apostolic teaching, yet convey the deep concern we have for the salvation of others, for their eternal joy, and not just for their temporary happiness. And that will come with our first having prepared ourselves as the good ground to receive the seed of God's wisdom. And then we indeed can produce good fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And then go forth as sowers of the seed ourselves, working to turn back the growing spiritual desert and remake this place as a green and fertile land. Amen.